Thanks for joining us for today's webinar on the basics of FLIR tool software. I'm Matt Schwegler of the Infrared Training Center, along with Jason Gagnon, our courseware manager and software instructor. Jason will join us here in a moment. First, a couple of announcements. For any questions, please submit them using the question icon located at the bottom right corner of the screen. Clicking the icon will open a new message window where you can type in your question, submit it, and we'll reply back via email by the next business day at the latest. We'll also be on Facebook tomorrow with a real-time question and answer session on today's topic. Go to facebook.com slash infrared training and join us online at that time. And finally, if you're interested in attending any one of our infrared training and certification classes, you'll find a complete calendar online at infraredtraining.com slash schedule. We've got a number of dates coming up at convenient locations across the U.S. and Canada. And for our fellow thermographers based in Europe, the Middle East, or Africa, head to irtraining.eu for the latest schedule and information on how to register. All right, let's bring in Jason Gagnon now for today's webinar on the basics of FLIR tools. Jason. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, as uh, Matt mentioned, this is a uh, tutorial series on the basics of the FLIR tools software. Uh, i got a quick intro PowerPoint here, and then we'll get into the actual software. I'll demonstrate a lot of the uh, most commonly used features with FLIR tools. Now, what is FLIR tools? If you're new to it, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a multi-purpose tool for importing, analyzing, and creating inspection reports using your thermal images. Um, this is free software, and it's downloadable from our Support Center website, which is support.fleer.com. Um, now, today we're just going to talk about FLIR tools, the free software. Um, you've probably heard about Tools Plus, which is an optional upgrade. Um, this adds basically three features. A Microsoft Word reporting module, so you can create your own templates and your own Word reports. Uh, a panorama module, so you can combine JPEGs together. And a uh, sequence recording function, so you can actually record live sequences uh, over USB and over Ethernet from a variety of different cameras. So those are the three pluses that you get with the upgrade. Um, Today, like I said, we're going to talk about just the freeware, uh, which is um, very comprehensive software. It gives you the ability to uh, import the images and analyze them. So you can do quite a bit with just the freeware. But if you find it to be a bit limiting, there's always an upgrade path to Tools Plus. Now, for today, um, we're going to basically take you through the entire process of importing images analyzing images, um, and uh, creating inspection reports. Uh, so we'll go through the image library, um, talk a little bit about how that works. Um, when we get into the analysis phase, we'll talk about the thermal tuning, uh, color palettes, measuring temperatures, object parameters, all those key things that you need to get right when you're uh, analyzing your images in order to produce that final PDF report. Now, we only have about a half hour today, so I'm going to touch on, uh, I try to touch on all these topics today. Um, during our information conference in September, we have actually two clinics on FLIR Tools and Tools Plus. Uh, these are an hour and a half each, so we'll have a little bit more time to get into other topics like the text annotation templates, uh, analyzing and processing sequence recordings, exporting data. So some of the things that we we can't always get to in this type of forum. Uh, we'll be able to cover in more detailed information. So if you're, if you're coming to the conference, uh, make sure you sign up for that. Um, all right, and that's it for PowerPoint. And uh, let's get into the software. Um, all right, if you're completely new to FLIR tools, this is the basic uh, user interface. Uh, this is what we call the image library. Um, if you've just installed it, you probably have just this FLIR folder, these other folders I've added. Um, so this is sort of the default location for your imported images. This is a folder that just resides in your My Documents folder. So as you begin to import images, you can create subfolders for all your different jobs and just kind of categorize them that way in these different folders. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import a few images um, using this import button. So the basic workflow here is that you would go out 
do your inspection, capture all your images, you come back to the office, you can either plug the camera in by USB, or if you have a removable SD card, you can take that out of the camera and plug it into your laptop. So you don't have to use the USB cable if you have the removable card. Um, with certain cameras like the E8, these have only built-in memory, so you have to use USB in this case. So it depends on the camera model. Um, so I'm going to hit import. I actually have a card plugged in to this PC, so I'm going to hit import. And it's going to scan and look for any cameras that are connected or any SD cards that are plugged in. And it's going to take a minute. It found something here on the G drive, which we can see over here. There's two folders there. And um, the reason why there are two folders is because many of these images were taken using E95. These new cameras that we have allow you to create uh, subfolders, which is a really nice camera feature that we hadn't had in some of the previous camera lines. So you can actually set up your card right in the camera with all these different folders. When you go to import, this is what you'll see. All the folders will show up over here. If you just have one folder, it's going to just show up, you know, just this folder here with all the images. If I click down to inspection, now you see these thumbnails here. Okay. So at this stage, I need to decide what I want to import. I can import all the folders, this button down uh, in the lower left, just move everything over to the PC. I can import the selected folder, either this one or the inspection folder. Okay, so it's completely up to you. You can also import specific images. So if I only want to import, say, these four images here, I can click on the first one, hold on shift, click on the last image. So it just selects those four. Then import items, which so you can see actually the button changes. So it's only going to import those four selected images with the gray border around them. Um, but in this case today, I think I'm just going to import all the folders. Um, there's not that many images here, so it shouldn't take too long. All right. So I'm going to click Import All, and I'm going to put them in the FLIR folder, but I want to create a subfolder. So I'm going to click on FLIR, so it's selected. Go to Create Subfolder. Just call it Webinar. And this shows you exactly where that is on your PC. It's under My Documents, FLIR, Webinar. Create that folder. Click on Import. And after about a minute or so, it's going to pull those images in. You can see that progress bar moving. So this will essentially copy them from the card over to your local PC. So once this is done, you don't need the card plugged in anymore. You don't need the USB cable connected. All right, so you have a local copy of the image to work on. And it looks like it's just about done. And yep, there we go. All right, so now we can see the content of the inspection folder and the 100 FLIR folder. All right. Now, if you click on these thumbnails, you will see kind of a preview on the right. It shows the thermal image, it shows the photo, and then there's some data underneath it about these thermal images. If you right click on these images, there are some options that come up. So you can delete some images that you don't need anymore. Just right click and go to delete. Okay. Now, if you want to actually get to one of these images, say you wanted to email this image to somebody, you don't want to make a report, you just want to send this image out to someone else to take a look at. So you don't have that option within the FLIR Tools library. But because these are just copied to your PC, um, on the right-click menu, you can open the containing folder. And this will show you all of those image files. So this is how you can access the actual images and the actual reports if you wanted to send them to someone else or maybe copy them to another drive. So everything's in your Windows Explorer.
Flare Tools just links to those folders so you can access them. Um, now, another thing you might notice, and we get this question a lot, is that if you view these in Windows, it shows only the thermal image. The reason for this is that the visual picture is embedded into the thermal image with these modern cameras that we have now. In the old days, you had a thermal and then you had a photo, and they were two separate pictures. Nowadays, everything's rolled into one image, this FLIR image format. So if you look at it in Windows, there's no photos, but they are there, and FLIR tools can find them. So we can see, as you view them here, you can see the thermal image, you can see the photo. When you make the report, the photo's automatically extracted and dropped into the inspection report. All right, so you don't have to worry about that. All right, now, the next phase of this process would be to analyze the images typically. All right, so now you've done your inspection, you want to take a closer look at the images, see if there's anything that you might need to change. Um, these images are data images, meaning that all the temperature information is embedded into these JPEGs. We call them radiometric JPEGs. Um, there's a lot of advantages to that versus just being a static image. Um, and we talk in the thermography classes about getting your focus and getting your range and your distance right. The three key things from a post-processing standpoint. Um, you have to be optically focused, you have to be close enough to measure if you're doing measurement, um, and you have to be in the right measurement range if you're doing measurement, right? Um, pretty much everything else you can change in the software. So I like to show this as an example of thermal tuning using the software. This is adjusting your range and your span, uh, which is kind of like brightness and contrast, to optimize the picture. Uh, most of the cameras have an auto adjust for this, and that's kind of the default mode. And this image is taken with the auto adjust enabled. Now, in cases like this, this is not ideal because the auto adjust basically takes into account all the temperatures in the entire image and sets the scale so everything is viewable. In many cases, that's okay. It'll work okay. But in a case like this, it's not, not the ideal situation because if we look in the upper left here, uh, you can see some of the clear sky. So when it does the auto adjust, it takes that into account. And clear sky is very cold. The camera's basically looking out into space. So the camera goes down as low as it can. These cameras are calibrated typically down to minus 40 or minus 20 C, somewhere in that range. So it goes all the way down as far as it can go. And uh, the um, consequence of that is that you lose a lot of detail in our other areas of the image. You know, we can't see much of this house is completely saturated. All right. So thankfully in the software, we can fix that pretty easily. Um, underneath the image, there are these two little brackets. These represent the upper limit and the lower limit of this temperature scale. So all we have to do to fix this is just to move this bracket to the right, closer to where the temperatures are that we're interested. So we don't care about the sky. We want to look at the house. And uh, we can narrow this down to try to optimize the image and basically just apply more colors to a smaller temperature window. And as we narrow that down, we can see that something's going on in the roof here. It's probably some missing insulation. With the auto adjust, you might miss that. So there are some situations where you might need to do this. This is one advantage of the radiometric format. If this was just a static image, you can't do that. Um, if you bring this image into a photo editor, you can't make those adjustments. These are unique to the IR image format, the data format. Um, now, with the thermal tuning, we can manually adjust, we can auto adjust, and there's a nice feature here in FLIR Tools called Auto Adjust Region. Um, this toolbar on the left contains all your measurement functions, your color palette, um, and then towards the bottom of this toolbar, if you point to this, it says set auto adjust or set adjust region. It's kind of like a local auto adjust. Um, so I can click on this box. I can come out here and say, I want to adjust this image within this area. Just click and drag the box. 
and then it auto adjusts it just within that area. So it's a quick way to locally adjust it without moving those brackets back and forth. So again, that's on the measurement toolbar. Got to click this once, right? Bring your mouse out, click and drag, just like that. You can move that around and it follows it. So it's kind of a neat tool. That's kind of unique to the software. Now, you can also change the color palette. Now, with the palettes, there's really no right or wrong palette. It's largely user preference. Um, the Iron Bow palette's used a lot, um, but in FLIR tools, there's a whole list of palettes that you can choose from. And you can just hover over it to preview it. And just, if you like one, just click on it to apply it. And um, there are some palettes like the Rainbow HC that have a little more contrast. So the HC stands for high contrast. So this allows you to see a little more detail in the image compared to some of the other palettes. Right. So just switching between the Rainbow HC and the iron here, you can see quite a bit of difference. Right, so we can actually see some detail in the roof here with the Rainbow HC. With the iron, you don't see that level of detail. So, so it is the palettes can be used as an analytical tool. It's not just a you know a pretty pretty colors really. You know, so it depends on what you're doing. So it's and whichever palette you use on the report. Like for instance, you could use the Rainbow HC as an analytical tool for you, and then switch it back to iron when you make the report. Um, so it's completely up to you. But you have that level of flexibility here with the images, uh, regardless of how they were saved in the camera. Okay, so that's thermal tuning, span adjustment, level adjustment, color palette. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the image modes. Uh, yeah, we'll use this one. Okay. Um, this I like to use as a good example of the MSX mode and some of the fusion modes that we have. Um, this uh, is just one of our labs, actually, in the in our classroom here. Um, the um, you can see a lot of detail in this image. Um, a lot of text here. You can see some text over on the left. Um, and a lot of this detail comes from the visual camera. It's not part of the, the thermal image. So the way that the MSX works is that it takes elements from the visual image and overlays them on top of the thermal image. And that's why you can see a lot of this detail. If you have a fusion image, whether it's MSX or picture in picture, whichever mode you used, you will have this toolbar across the top. If you have just a plain thermal with no fusion, you won't see that. Right? But since this was taken with a camera that has MSX, we can see that that's enabled. Now, to see the true thermal image, you can click this button. So that's what the thermal image really looks like without the visual elements. And so you can see quite a difference there. And you can change these modes in the cameras too. Um, and the MSX can be a little bit deceptive. Um, you know, you can see some some sharp edges in the MSX uh, in the visual image that aren't necessarily there in the thermal image. So, in particular, in the camera, if you're trying to really focus an image, um, you might want to switch over to the thermal to make sure it's 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 properly focused. Don't just rely on the MSX uh, part of the image. So you have the MSX, you have the plain thermal, and then you have these other fusion modes. So because the thermal and the photo are, are combined, um, it, the software can blend them in different ways, and that's what we call fusion. So this here is a um, kind of like an isotherm fusion, meaning that the span can be set to show only the thermal image between 
a certain temperature region uh, or temperature span. All right, so um, you can kind of isolate, say, the problem area and show just that on top of the, the visual picture. Um, this is a thermal blending, like a transparent mode. This is a picture-in-picture -picture mode, which many of the cameras have. Um, you can actually, in the software, sort of unlock this with this button right up here. And then you can resize it and move it around. It's kind of like a window into the thermal image. So kind of cool on a report, particularly for somebody who's not used to looking at thermal images. The last button is for the, just the pure photo. Right. So you have all those buttons available to you right up here. Okay. We haven't actually talked about measurement yet, but we can, you can do a fair amount of temperature measurement with the software. Everything we've talked about so far has just been qualitative, interpretive. But all these tools over here allow you to perform temperature measurements. So you can add spot meters, just a single point measurement. You have two area tools, a box and an ellipse, for measuring, say, maximum or average temperature. You have a line tool, and then you have a delta T for measuring a temperature difference between any of those tools. Adding them is very simple. Just click on the spot so it's pressed in like that. Come up to the image, click wherever you want to place that on the image. You move those around, add as many as you can fit. As you begin to add these spots, this table will begin to expand out. So in the measurements table, we see spot one through four. Um, to delete a spot, just right click and delete. All right. The um, areas, if we click on the box or a rectangle tool, uh, we can click and drag diagonally to draw that on the image. And this can measure the maximum temperature, which is represented by the red triangle, the minimum temperature, which is the blue triangle here, and the average temperature inside that box. And you can see all three values over here in the measurements table. And you can have multiple boxes. You can draw an ellipse. So you can have several, you know, as many combinations of different tools as you would need. Now, with these area tools, they can show all three values, but you don't have to show all three. Um, on the right-click menu, you have some options for these measurement tools. So if I right-click inside this box, I can go to local, max, min, and average markers. The very first item on that right-click menu and I can choose to not show, say, minimum and average. If you only care about max, you can just choose not to show those other uh, items. Click OK. And now box one shows only maximum. So it can help to reduce the amount of data that's showing up on your reports by just focusing in on what you're interested in and not necessarily those other parameters. And again, just like the spots, if you want to delete an area, right click and click delete. The next measurement function is the line. So we can click and drag that across the image. And uh, similar to the area, the line shows maximum, minimum, and average temperature. Uh, but instead of in a, in a region, it shows it across that line from point A to point B, whatever pixels it touches. So we talked about spots, areas, lines. The last measurement function here is the delta function. Uh, so if I click on this, it adds a row to the table at the very end. It's called DT1. And there's a little kind of a gear button there. If you point to it, it says edit. So I can choose any of the measurement functions that are currently on the image. 
And this will calculate a temperature difference between any of these two tools. So if temperature rise is something that you report on, this gives you a nice easy way to figure out what that is. And uh, for instance, I can select box one, which would be this box here, maximum temperature, you can do minimum or average also. And then say if you had a reference spot set up somewhere, let's just say spot four, like that. All right, that's it. And it shows you that the difference between those two is about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. You can have multiple delta T's. If I click that again, adds another row. So you can see it's pretty easy to have a, a wide variety of different types of measurement tools on the same image. Now, of course, all of these numbers here that it shows are dependent on the object parameters. This is something that we spend a lot of time in our thermography classes about. It can be complicated, depends on what you're measuring. Um, but the nice thing about the software is that you can change emissivity, reflected temperature, and all of these other parameters that feed this formula that outputs a temperature. Some of the cameras only have emissivity and reflected. But through the software, you can access all these parameters regardless of the camera that you're using. Um, these are basically just text boxes. You can backspace and type a new value, hit enter. It makes all the adjustments for you. And these are what I would call global settings universally across the entire image. Um, you can also set local parameters. So if you had a more complex image with different emissivities. You can right click on any of these measurement tools, go to local parameters, which is the second menu on the right click, uh, or second item I should say, and then go to local parameters and you can set an emissivity for just that measurement tool, just that box. So I'll just set it to something really low here. Um, so now, the measurements that you're, you're seeing from that box are using the local emissivity, not global emissivity here. And anytime you do that, it'll show this little eye symbol here. If you point to it, it actually shows you what the emissivity is. Um, it doesn't change the image, so this can get a little complicated if you're, you just have to be careful to watch for that symbol so you know, because the colors all look the same. It's, it's changing it in the formula, not not for the image itself, but it's a powerful tool. Um, if you're looking at complex images, printed circuit boards is a good example I can think of, of where you might need to do this, where you have so many different items in one in the field of view, they're all very different. So yeah. really the only way to accurately measure, you know, uh, all those different types of items in one image is to be able to use the local parameters. So where we kind of talk a little bit about emissivity. Oh, that's great. I love that lab. Some of the challenges here. So basically, if we look at the visual picture, this is just a shiny plate with some white tape down, or not tape, but uh, paint, some kind of flat paint down here. That's the white area, and this little scuffed up region here. Um, so that's what it looks like to us. This is what it looks like to the camera. And you can see just by looking at it that the temperature is very quite a bit. The reason is to do, it has to do with the emissivity because all these different regions emit differently. This is pretty close to 0.95. So if we put a spot down here, that's about 240 degrees Fahrenheit. That's closest to the true temperature. If we put a spot over here, the scuffed up area emits a little bit better. It's around 113, but not as good as the paint. This is a very poor emitter. Reflective metals are very hard to measure. So most of what this is showing you, or measuring here, most of what this is, uh, uh, the spot is showing you is due to reflection, ambient reflection. Uh, it's not the true emitted temperature. So just in this image, you can see that this can be really complicated. So a little bit about emissivity there. Um, let me go back to my image. How do I? Okay. Try to wrap up here in just a minute. Um, so back to the image that we were working on earlier. Um, so we talked about thermal tuning, we talked about measurement, we talked about parameters, both global and local parameters. Um, last thing here I wanna talk about just a 
just briefly is the ability to add notes to the images. Um, if you're diagnosing something and you see that there's a problem with this breaker, so instead of just putting it in the report, you can actually put it into the JPEG. So it becomes part of that image. So if you open it six months later, you'll see that note there in that image. Um, it's good for trending, um, certainly good to have that data all wrapped up in that, that radiometric format. So we can uh, just type a little note. You know, A lot of the cameras have this now too, where you can have the camera prompt you for text, and then the keyboard will come up, you just type in your note. Um, if you do that, it's gonna show up in that box that notes box. A um, little further down, there's something called text annotations where you can add a label and a value. So if there was equipment ID here, let's say, you know, if you're doing inspections and all the equipment is tagged in some way, you can put that in as a label and then just put whatever the value is next to it. And then you can add another row say location or problem or whatever. It's more of a table kind of format, whereas the note's just a freehand note. So both of these, you know, however you do this, whether it's text annotations or notes, it all gets wrapped up into that JPEG format. Okay. And then all that data, everything you see in the table here, is gonna show up in our report when we make the report in just a second. Okay. So that's pretty much the analysis process and all the different options that you have here in FLIR tools. All right. So let me save and close. And we'll go back to the image library. So let's say that we're done with our image analysis. We want to make the inspection report. Um, before you make a report, um, go up to options and go to the report tab. Because this is where you can set your own logo and you can add some header and footer text that will appear on all the pages in the report. So with the free flow tools, you can't make templates, but you can customize the reports uh, in some ways by adding your own logo and adding some, you know, some custom text. If you want to get more in-depth, you know, as far as templates go, then there's the Tools Plus option. But but uh, like, like you see here, I put in our ITC logo, I put in my, you know, the Infra Training Center, my name, you can put your address in here. So it's always on your reports. Um, and you can also choose to show all parameters. Now the default here is to only show emissivity and reflected temperature on your reports, which might be fine. But if you wanna show everything, um, you have to click that check mark before the report's made. So that shows the external optics and the you know, uh, atmospheric temperature and humidity and all those other parameters in that, in that list. Um, so. While we're here, someone would ask, ask about units, uh, Fahrenheit, oh, yeah. Celsius, and, and I always forget about that. Yep, that's right here. So you have report, and then right next to it is your units. So Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, meters and feet right there. That's one of those things that is um, set in the software. So if you use Fahrenheit in the camera, the software will default to Celsius. It doesn't read that from the image. That's set locally on the software. So just be aware of that. Um, go up to options again, upper right corner, and you'll find all those settings right up here. Report and units. Okay. So now that I have my report settings ready to go, I can choose the images. So if you want to put all these images into your report, there's a shortcut way to select all. Um, if you hover over the path here, so this shows where those images are on my PC, kind of uh, the color changes, so it's kind of like a bluish color. I can click on that, and it selects everything in that folder. All right, Just a quick and easy way to select all. Um, don't have to do that. If you want to just pick, say, these, this group of images, click on the first image, hold down shift, click on the last image. Just selects that row. So it's up to you. I'm going to select all, go to generate report, and then with the free tools, you won't have this first row. This is from Tools Plus, but you'll have the last two. So the FLIR tools report templates is what you get with FLIR tools. And there's 
several different formats. Um, this icon, kind of like the gradient icon, is the thermal image. The icon with the mountains is the photo. So probably the most commonly used one is the iron photo side by side. Um, this is IR only, this is photo only, and this, these are just different combinations of the IR and the photo. So all I have to do is click on this, and it's going to generate the report with those selected images. And it just makes a page for each pair of images. So this one had no photo, so that's blank. Go down here, image number two. Image number three, and this is the image. Okay, this is the image we were working on. So you can see how the logo is on all the pages. The header and footer text is there. You can see all of the measurement data, the parameters, the notes, the text. So it's all there. You can move these tables around. And well, this one's kind of all grouped together. You can move this one around anyway. But. Um, so you have some control over that. Up top here, you can add a text box where you can just type freehand text, whatever you want to type about the report, like that. Um, you can add an arrow, which could be very helpful on your reports. We're trying to correlate an area on the thermal image with the photo. Just draw an arrow, kind of connect, connecting the two. Um, and you can edit the image. So it's still sort of an active report. So if you make a large report and you realize that you had something wrong on one image, say the palette's wrong or whatever, you don't have to recreate the report. You can just double click on the image on the report page. It opens it up in an editor view which is just basically what we were just doing. Um, the difference is that any changes that you make here are going to be only done in this report. So you just have to be aware of that. Um, other than that, it's you know, perfectly fine. It, you, know, you, you, can still, you can still move these tools around. Um, but just be aware that that setting is not going to feed back to the original image. It's only in that report. The last thing you want to do here or maybe the first thing, is uh, save it. So we have the save and export. Always save it, because when you go to save as, this will save it in your image library as an REPX report. This is an editable FLIR tools report. So you always want to save it in this format. And then you have the option to export it to PDF for sharing with others. Um, so I'm going to save it up in this folder here. <clears throat> and so because it's editable, you can come back anytime. You can make changes. All the thermal images are all wrapped up into that format. Um, the export option will just make a PDF copy of your report, which is much better choice if you're emailing these to clients or, or anybody. Because um, the RepX format requires our software. So and PDF is more or less kind of like a screenshot of each page, so you can't do any editing really with the PDF. And for those of you doing the uh, the field assignment uh, mm -hmm. with our level one or level two training classes, the PDF is uh, the format that we would like those uh, submitted in. So this is mm -hmm. uh, using the export features, how to get that uh, data out. Yeah, for sharing by any means, typically ex uh, export to PDF is the best way to do it. Um, also, for the fail assignment, make sure you show all parameters, you know, object parameters, yeah. which I was talking about under the options. That's a that's a requirement for the field report. Um, but there you go. There's a nice PDF copy. So now the final step here, ultimately, you would want to share these reports, right, like we were just talking about. So, again, from the FLIR tools user interface, if, you know, the, there's not an easy way to, like, send this out to somebody. So what you would have to do is right click, open the folder, open the containing folder, and just like we did earlier, this gives you access to the actual files, the images, and in this case, the reports. So now you can drag that into an email and send it off. So that's the whole process, importing, analyzing, reporting. Before I uh, 
take control back over. Did you want to maybe briefly mention about support, where to go for oh, support? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, Jason, uh, we've got a new website now for uh, customers. Well, not a new website, but a, a site where you go for any support questions uh, where you can get an answer from someone in your in your region. Yeah. This helps coordinate that feedback. Uh, uh, and this support.flare.com is the website for that. Yeah, this is the best way. If you have any technical questions about cameras, software, anything like that, um, Go to support.flare.com. Um, this is a, um, a global support system that we have now that we've had available for several years. Um, there's a pretty uh, detailed knowledge base. So if, uh, you can just search, and a lot of the questions, the common questions that we get, we publish to the knowledge base. So you might be able to find an answer to your question just by searching. Um, all of our software downloads are available there. Um, you can find your service office if you have to send the camera back. We have a list of all the different offices around the world that can service your cameras. Um, and you can also ask a question. So if you can't find the answer that you're looking for, you can go here and ask a question, and then it gets assigned to someone in your area. So we have support agents all over the world that monitor these. And this is a, kind of like a help desk system. So when you ask a question, it creates an incident ID that we can track and reassign. And we try to get back to you within 24, 48 hours, um, and um, you know some questions we can answer pretty quickly. Other questions may need yeah. some more um, uh, assistance from others. But the beauty of the system is that we can pretty easily escalate and reassign the incidents. So um, it's really it, it's the best way to to find support. Emails get lost and things. So if you go here, because it gets entered into the database, we have a record of it, and uh, we can we'll definitely help you out through here. So. Um, and Matt might talk about this too, but I wanted to mention this. Um, we have a lot of on-demand training. Um, it, there's two different areas you can go. The irtraining.com is ITC's official uh, on-demand training site. Mm -hmm. um, we have several different videos for camera operations, software, and on basic thermography. Um, some of the questions that we got about emissivity, some of these are, are touched on at some level in these on-demand classes. The certification classes are much more detailed if you really want to learn how to measure temperatures correctly. The, the courses are the way to go. But this is a good place to start, and it'll give you a, a nice overview of how the technology works. And the YouTube channel is another good resource. Um, I have a bunch of Flare Tools videos that talk a lot about the stuff we've been demonstrating today. So it's a good way to get a, a review of some of these topics, how to import, analyze, and report. Um, there's some Tools Plus videos up there, too. So um, we have a lot of content out there that uh, for, for learning on demand. Yeah. So just wanted to mention those. Excellent. Thank you. Well, let's wrap it up. That'll do it for today's session. Remember, besides submitting questions via the icon below, we'll be on Facebook tomorrow for a real-time question and answer session. Go to facebook.com slash infrared training to join us online at that time. You can also catch this topic on demand. Head to infraredtraining.com slash webinars where you'll find this subject as well as about two dozen other topics all free and available for viewing at any time. Of course, all of our upcoming training dates and locations in the U.S. and Canada are posted online at infraredtraining.com slash schedule. For those of you in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, head to irtraining.eu for the latest list of classes in your region. Well, thanks again for attending today's session. We'll see you online again soon for our next tutorial from the Infrared Training Center.